Good morning. Today's scripture is John 21, 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. You'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, as we read and study your word, help us to help it to be alive. Help it to pierce into and divide in our soul and spirit, Lord, so that we will see your amazing love, to love you more so that we can love others more, to apply scripture to our lives, to be obedient to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and follow in the steps of the spirit. Lord, we just thank you and praise you that we do have a safe, warm place to come. Lord, and we pray for those that don't have that so much in their homes and other things, Lord, that you just provide for them and and any circumstance that they're in, Father, that you love us and, and want the best for us. And most of all, you want us to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So help us to be the light that you have called us to be so that others see Christ in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So are you keeping up with your... Um, devotions and whatever you're doing for your reading plan. There's a few down here if you need one. Yesterday's, is this me? Or another one? What I can do with it. How about now? Okay. If you read yesterday's, it, the title is this, The Oldest Christian Confession. What is that? I mean, you, it talks about you can quote the Nicene Creed and other things. But the biggest thing is Jesus is Lord. Is He? Looking back at the Old Testament, if you're reading through and reading the Old Testament, whatever you're doing, you see that God is sovereign. He is Lord, creator of all. He created you. He wants the best for you. And He's a pretty awesome God because He puts up with you. <laughs> Putting it simply. And Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Is He just your Savior, or is He your Lord? goes on to say at the end of that devotional, Do I really confess with my life, as well as my lips, that Jesus is Lord? Do I really believe that He has total claim over my life and every right to command my allegiance and obedience? Do I really accept that He knows better than me and that I may hold nothing back from Him? Jesus is Lord is no trite statement. Is Jesus your Lord? And then the next um, devotional for today is, talks about forgetting our Lord. Because so many times we get wrapped up in things and forget all about serving our Savior and Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you doing that with your life today? Last week I entitled the message, After Dinner. I mean, excuse me, At the Table with Jesus. This week I entitled it, After Dinner. Will you continue to follow? If, if you realize the love that Jesus Christ gave to you, if you love Him back lavishly because you realize that love and what He did for you, that it saved you from the gates of hell for all eternity, will you continue to walk that way? Or will you get distracted? Or better yet... Will you not let him lead you where you don't want to go? (laughs) That's why we read the scripture that we read this morning. Will you let him take over your life, lead you wherever it is, because his purpose is greater than yours, and know that he loves you regardless? Is the Spirit leading you? 
Where is the Spirit leading you? What Jesus did for you, like I said, was give you life. And He came so that you might have abundant life and joy. He told the woman to go in peace that her sins had been forgiven. I'll give you a little example, and yeah, I got this one from studying other sermons and stuff, but it makes sense. If you see two people and they're both dead, they're both dead. If one got blown up by a hand grenade and one of them died in his sleep, they're both dead. One's messy dead, ugly dead, it's, a hurt. it's terrible, but death is still death. Maybe this one lived a good long age, maybe he didn't, doesn't matter, they're both dead. And if Jesus Christ came and gave them both life again, should they not both be equally as joyful and thankful and everything else? So I don't know your past or anything else. I don't know the struggles you're going through today. But I know that if you're born again, that you should be leading, being led. That means there's a leader by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you're going to go where you don't want to go. So that takes us back to the question again. Who do, I, who do you say that I am? The woman... And I'm speculating here. I'm going to add to the story. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I don't think she went back to the life she lived. I don't think she went back to a life that was just like, okay, I'm saved now. I won't do this anymore. I'll go pursue a different career. I think she followed Jesus. That's just my thought process. So that takes me to my life, and am I following Jesus? Or am I just holding on to, hey, I'm saved or am I letting the king lead me? Am I, am I doing my best to read and study scripture and being united in fellowship with one another and letting the spirit lead me even where I don't want to go? Galatians 5 verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. For through the spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. You, my brothers and sisters, I'm dropping down to verse 13, were called to be free, but do not let your, use your freedoms to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly and in love. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and what the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Are you walking a life of faith being led by the Spirit? If you're not, you might be born again. You might be born above, born of the Holy Spirit. But you're not being led. That means you're still being led by your sinful nature, by some other master. Because you cannot serve two masters. You will serve one or the other, and you will love one or the other. Is Jesus the affection and adoration of your heart? And to be led, you've got to have a leader. And that means you have to follow. In John 16, verses 12 through 15, Jesus said these words, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me because it is from Me that He will, rec that he will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is Mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will receive from me what He makes known to you. Is the Spirit continuing to reveal Jesus to you and in you, guiding you into all truth? In Revelation, we read these words in Revelation 7, 16 and, 7, 16 and 17. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
So where was that woman led? Well, if we read on in Luke chapter 7, here's how Luke chapter 8 begins. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with Him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from, from whom seven demons had come out, Jonah, the wife of Susa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their means. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, He told them this parable, A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, this woman was unnamed, and we don't know if she's in this crowd now or not. She is probably not Mary Magdalene, because it's talked specifically here who Mary Magdalene is, and it's not referring back to the woman that we just talked about. So it's probably not her. Uh, definitely, probably not jo Jonah. Susanna, probably not. Probably she's still unnamed. But wait a minute. If this woman was part of this scripture that Luke is writing here now, because he's writing an orderly account so that we know what we believe so that we can live it because we are friends of God. If he's writing this story, then she has changed her profession. If she's one helping to provide for the ministry now financially or however she's supporting, she has changed her life. She has realized she is a new creation in Christ. Oh yeah, and she's the ugly dad over here. Yeah, she's left all that behind, but she still left it behind. What about the person over here who's not ugly dead? They're just dead that brought to life. Did you leave everything behind? Because you're a new creation in Christ. Is there anything of that old nature that you're still hanging on to? Whether it's sins that you're doing or demons that are, are getting into your life telling you can't do this or that or anything else, I don't know what it is. I don't know that there's anything. But is there any sin or anything else that's entangling you, weighing you down so that you're not running this race and running it together? Maybe it'll be the, just the fact that you can't get along with an, another fellow believer. But we're supposed to have unity, and we're supposed to say words that build them up, not tear them down. We're supposed to live a life of love, especially among fellow believers. Who are you serving? You know, the harvest is out there, but the workers are few. The harvest is great. So I think she continued to walk by faith and was led by the Spirit. Here's some more words from Jesus that... I think she knew whether she heard yet at this point or not. And the point is, is, do you recognize these words and do you live them? In John 14, verses 15 to 18, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Are you listening to that advocate, the one who has come beside of you to join with you with this mission that you still have to be like Jesus in this world, that you're His disciple trained up to be like Him? It is the Spirit of truth, verse 17. He is the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So if you're the dead that's brought back to life, either way, the power of the new life that you have in Jesus Christ is period through the Holy Spirit, which was the power of Jesus in His ministry Himself. And the power, Scripture tells us, that rose Jesus from the dead. In John 14, verse 25, All this I have spoken while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Not some things, but everything. Peace I leave you, just like He told the woman. My peace I give you. That's different peace, isn't it? That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. The peace that I can have no matter whether I'm in the wilderness or whether I'm struggling with the sins I have or depressions I have or, or addictions I have or anything else that is or struggling with love. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What keeps so many Christians from stepping out of the boat and walking on water, so to speak, is that they're too afraid of what might happen. I would serve you, Lord, but I'm afraid of, lose, of leaving my job, not having finances. I'm afraid I'm not equipped. Whatever it is that you're afraid of, why do we worry about those things? 
I think she continued to walk, and I think she would have even walked into the wilderness. I told you I'd probably be preaching a little bit on Luke since we didn't have much time, so I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute. But I want to read you a little more scriptures first about the Spirit in our lives. In Romans 8, verses 12 and 13, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if we live according to the flesh, we, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Romans 12, verses 1 to 3, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, I beg with you, I plead with you, in view of God's mercy, you were both dead. We were all dead in our trespasses and sin, but He has given you new life, now in this earth and forevermore. Because of God's mercy, I beg you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. A living sacrifice. Putting yourself on the altar and feeling all the pain of that and not getting back up off the altar because your life is not your own. You're giving it to Jesus. Something that's not easy to do. Something you cannot do on your own. Something that you can only do being led by the Spirit. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Oh, Lord, increase my faith then, right? I mean, that's my first prayer so that I can go through these things, so that my mind can be renewed, so that I can wait on God's timing, learn what His will is. Because when I have my concerns and my prayers, I want to put God into my timing. I don't want to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. I want my prayers answered now. And if I don't know what God's will is, and sometimes I want to take things into my own hand and not give them to God whether it's something as much as vengeance or if it's something else and just taking this plan of action to, to, to come to this. Is the Spirit leading you? That means you have a leader and you're being led. You have to listen. You have to realize who the King of kings is and the Lord of lords, that you're bowing down and giving your allegiance to Him and the Holy Spirit is your conduit. Are you willing to go where you don't want to go, just as He told Peter? Will you feed the sheep? Do you love Him? Is Jesus your everything, the desire of your heart? Do you realize the great, great, great love that has been given to you so that you can love greatly? Do you realize the grace upon grace upon grace that's been given to you so that you can be gracious to others? Well, let's look at Jesus' life Himself. Luke chapter 3, and I'll be in Luke uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4 if you want to turn there. But Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 23, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. John argued with him and said, no, I can't baptize you. But he said, let it be so, whatever it might be. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. And then we get the lineage that Luke writes. Different than Matthew's, and we we'll, won't get into that today, but Luke has his purpose in what he's writing. But here we are in Luke chapter 3, and here's a high point in Jesus' life. He's a man. He's flesh and blood. He gave up. Scripture says he didn't consider equality with God something to be gained. He was fully human. Don't ever forget that. He faced everything that you faced. So when you're facing this temptation, Jesus faced it and more. When you find comfort because the Holy Spirit is with you and comfort alone that you've been brought back to life, that you will not face God's wrath for all eternity, then you can comfort others as He is... Uh, Corinthian, the author, well, Paul says to the Corinthian church, I'll get it out now. Do you realize all these things? But here's a high point. 
Everybody sees Jesus and a voice comes from heaven and they see the Holy Spirit come down. Wow, I, I, what, what's, what's going to happen next? He's going to be led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days without food. Boy, that changes, doesn't it? So many times we think, okay, this has happened in my life. This is good. This is, everything's going great. And then we are on the valley floor, aren't we? Will you trust him then? Or will you turn to a prosperity gospel or, or something like that? Prosperity gospel is not new. <laughs> And I hope all of you know what I mean there, but that means that we take Scripture and we twist it and say that God does work everything for us and this can't be in God's will if this is bad. That's not true. That's why we're looking right here at how the Gospel of Luke starts. Matthew's is the same basic way. 1 John 3, 1 to 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we could be called children of God. You're a son or a daughter of God adopted into His family. He has said, I love you. He has given you His Spirit. Look back at the Old Testament if you're reading again and everything that the priest had to do, and now you have direct access to the Father where you can cry out to Him as your dad, as Scripture says. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we could be, should be called children of God, and that is what we are. <laughs> John says it again so you understand what he just read. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. All who have the, this hope purify themselves just as He is pure." You get led to places where you don't necessarily want to go because guess what? If you get led to this place over here, it might have just been to teach you patience and to build your faith and your character so you can endure something even harder next time. Or that you can go through because you went through this cancer, you can be a comfort to someone else who's going through this cancer. doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. In fact, Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles and don't be surprised because they wanted to murder me. They didn't. I gave up my life. But they wanted to destroy me. So the more that you let the Spirit lead you, the more Satan is going to attack you. The more that you need to give control to God through the Holy Spirit. Luke 4 starts this way. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days He was tempted by the devil. I don't know what Jesus thought as a man. I don't know how much was revealed to him at this point in time. I'm not going to try to speculate, but I know this as a man. He wouldn't want to go spend 40 days in the wilderness without food being tempted and tested by the devil. No man would want that. If you read from Mark, you'll read this. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. At the time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, He saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descended on Him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are My Son, who, am I, who I love, with you I am well pleased. And then you have this put in there in Mark. At once the Spirit sent Him out in the wilderness. Wait a minute, no time to go celebrate with my buddies, with, the, with whoever it is, my family. I get taken straight in the wilderness. I just come from this high point where the heavens are torn apart and the Spirit of God comes on me and immediately or at once the Spirit takes me to the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Not tempted just at the end, not just the three things that we have that, that's recorded in Scripture, but he was tempted, oh let me throw this in there as a human being, tormented also for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you think Satan quit quit attacking him when he went to sleep. <coughs> and he had to rely on God totally. Oh yeah, there's a direct correlation to the failure of Adam in the garden. Adam was in paradise and could eat anything he wanted. Jesus was in the wilderness and had nothing to eat. And Jesus didn't sin, Adam did sin. Oh yeah, the children wandered around 40 years in, in, the, in the desert and they long, or the wilderness and longingly looked back. Built, made idols, grumbled and complained, and many died. 
And all of that generation, none of them saw the land that God promised. So Jesus was tempted and past all temptation. He's there to give you comfort and power and peace, peace that you won't know any other way if you'll just let Him be the one who leads you and guides you. If you'll profess that He is Lord and mean it. Matthew's account. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. As soon as the, Jesus was baptized, He went up out of the water. At the moment heaven was opened and saw the Spirit of God descending on Him like a dove and lighting on Him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. Then, Matthew writes in a chronological order, the next thing that happens was Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Not just happenstance that he went to the wilderness, but the Spirit led him to be tempted. This was God's purpose. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, to say the least. The Father gave him a full filling of the Spirit, not just for ministry, but to be tempted first before he went into ministry. He had to rely on angels to take care of him. Created beings again, higher than we are. You won't go any, all down that trail again, but again, he had to submit to creation, the creator of all things. And he had to be tempted and tested by Satan and his demons, fallen angels. And after 40 days, verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And they will lift, up their, lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, and it is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to your test. Again the devil took him to up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world with all their splendor. And this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Okay, I told you I'm reading from Luke, but I read you Matthew's first, so you'll see the difference. Luke's was most likely, I mean, Matthew's was most likely written in chronological order. If you don't remember from Luke, we'll see in a second, the order is different because Luke is writing in an orderly account. Okay? Notice here also that the devil says, if you'll bow down and worship me. Oh, we think so many times that we're not bowing down because we don't do this or that. But again, if you're not with Jesus, you're against Jesus. If you're not gathering, you're scattering. If you're not serving the Lord, you are serving the God of this world, the things of this world, whatever your idols are, whether you realize that or not. Luke carefully investigates and writes in a different order. So we want, I want to look at why that is. But before I do that, and if you want to do homework, read Hebrews again. Because Hebrew, and it won't take you that long. Hebrews will tell you again the story of what all happened up to the coming of Jesus Christ, and then tell you our story about how we're supposed to run this race with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus. But to tell you a little bit from what is written here in Hebrews, Hebrews 2, verse 10, And bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what He suffered. Starting 40 days in the wilderness, being led somewhere where you don't want to be led, right after a high point, heading to the valley low to see if Jesus as a man would trust God and worship only Him. Verse 11, Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So are you living like a brother or a sister? Verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, He too shared in their humanity 
so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all, who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to make, be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he was able to help those who were being tempted. Man, that is huge. Because we fight that spiritual battle. Every day we fight one. Every single day. And every single day we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, that suffering, and follow after Jesus wherever the Holy Spirit leads you. And many times it won't be where you want to go. And you won't understand how God is going to work through this situation. But know that He will. Know that He loves you. Know that a hair won't be harmed on your head without doing that. And be obedient and trust in Him. Even for daily bread that might not come for 40 days. Hebrews 3.14 says, We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Listen to Jesus. So now I'm in Luke chapter 4. We're going to look at this passage and examine it a little bit. Luke writes, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus was God. It's easy for Him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, let me give you where that same word is used. Acts 7 Acts chapter 7, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. So don't say that you can't be full of the Holy Spirit. But Stephen had to be led, didn't he, to get to this point where he was full of the Holy Spirit. He had to be obedient. He had to trust God for all this to happen. And facing death, he proclaimed Jesus Christ as the way to salvation rather than worrying about his only life and ask for forgiveness for those who were killing him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. His high point came at the end. That was the end of his life. We might question why, how, whatever this did, but he fixed his eyes on Jesus and he saw heaven opened up. And Jesus saying, come. Come. I, I love the part, too, that this Scripture says here that the Son of Man is standing because other Scripture says that He's sitting, advocating for us. I think He got up and said, Come home, buddy. Come home, Fred. Come home, brother. Because I know you. We don't know why our lives are the way they are or what day that our life will be taken, accountable for. So each and every breath we need to live in awe of God our Creator and amazingly in love with Jesus our Redeemer and Lord. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit where? Into the wilderness. Why there? I gave you some ideas already because of Israel and the comparison there and the the contrast of the Garden of Eden and everything, but doesn't you don't have to figure it all out. You just have to say, where do I need to go? I'll follow. You don't have to know all the answers. The, before Jesus ascended, Lord, are you going at this time restore the kingdom of, of Israel? It's not for you to know the times or seasons. You don't need to know those things, but you will be my witnesses. That's what you need to know. And to be my witness, you have to listen to the Holy Spirit. You have to cleanse yourself. You have to let the Holy Spirit guide you into all truth, change the way you think, and transform you into my image and likeness. Where for 40 days, verse 2, he was tempted by the devil. Not just so many times I talk to Christians, and they say at the end of that time period he was tempted. No, he was tempted the whole time. We have the last three accounts or three accounts on the last day, whatever it is. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. In the end he was hungry. 
If that's what hunger is, I've never known hunger in neither of you. Because <laughs> we've never got to that point where our body, physical as a human being again, is craving so food so bad that you want to eat anything for nourishment. No matter what it's crawling there or anything else. But he didn't. He trusted God. So at this point, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. What would have been wrong with that? Jesus could have done that as, as God, as the, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Would there have been anything wrong? Not in the physical act of turning stones to bread, but in not trusting God, there's, <laughs> there's something terribly wrong. Do you trust God even when it looks like there's no hope at all? Jesus' answer, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Oh, and now we're going back directly with Jesus' quote to the wanderings in the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. Why? So that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised as an oath to your ancestors. If you follow the commands of God, you will live, increase, and enter and possess the land the Lord has promised. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land that was great, but nothing in comparison to what Jesus will bring and give you for all eternity. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years? To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. So if Jesus would have turned, he tells Satan that. If I did do that, not to say I can't, and you've already started out this way, if you are who you say you are, I have nothing to prove. If I did that, I would not be trusting God. I would not let him be teaching me. I would not be learning patience. I would not be doing whatever it is that the Spirit drove me in the wilderness to do, whether he fathomed all of that as a human being or did not. To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. He did this to teach you. And here's what Jesus quoted. That man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, which is in Matthew's account, the rest of that part is. But see, you've got to go back here and learn the Scriptures and learn the failure of human beings, even God's cho chosen, His children. And while they did not live and prosper and increase, so to speak, and did not enter a land flowing with milk and honey. The purpose of, the, of them hungering was to teach them. But what happened when he fed them with manna? Oh, it's wonderful wafers from heaven, honey from heaven. But pretty soon we've had enough and we want something else, something more, because we're not satisfied with what God gives us. Uh, life again in either circumstance is life. <laughs> and we owe everything to the one who gives us life. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Oh, discipline's a good thing. We might not see it at that time, but it is. Observe the commands of the Lord your God. Walk in obedience to Him and revering Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a new land. And look at the difference between the promised land and heaven. Verse 5 of Luke chapter 4, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. We don't know if this was a vision or how this happened. Matthew says he led him up to a mountain, high place. I don't know how that's happening and it doesn't matter again. I don't need to know all the ways and hows. I know that somehow the devil elevated him to a position where he could see all the glory of this world. 
I see what little glory of the world that I see out here, and it does intrigue me. I do want to enjoy it. I do want to say that God has good things planned for me and wants me to enjoy this or that. But if i got plans to go do this today and the Spirit's leading me in a different direction, who am I listening to? Am I listening to myself and, and the desires of my heart, or am I listening to the Spirit? And Luke took these out of order, but remember he's writing in an order he wants to write in by the Holy Spirit's direction. So it's okay that these are not in order that we need to worry about so much. But he's writing to Gentiles. Okay, well, Matthew's writing more to a uh, Jewish audience that their thought process is different. Here, we've got to understand as Gentiles, not knowing as much of the Old Testament and the festivals and the law and so forth, that we need to live by the Word of God. That we need to trust in Him. We need to revere Him as Creator, as Lord, as Redeemer. And now we've got to watch out for the enticements of this world, or guess what? We're going to be dragged away, enticed away, whatever. We're never going to make it to the temple pinnacle where the Israelites would have looked at the temple, temple, temple and not realized that they had other idols and were being drawn away. There's a difference in the sequence. <clears throat> and he said to him, verse 6, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Boy, that's so much like in the garden again. There's some partial truths, isn't there? He is the prince of this world. He does have authority, but his authority is in check with what God allows. Don't forget that. So he cannot do anything to you outside of God's will All these promises that He can make to you, <laughs> they're just to lead you astray. They're to make you not effective for the kingdom. They're so that you will serve Him, whether you have that concept or not, of bowing down to Him, or whether you'll serve the Lord or not. Money's not bad. Money's not the root of all evil. It gets said that so many times from Scripture. That's where you haven't studied God's Word correctly. The love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil. Because when you start having other lovers, it leads to an adulterous life cycle of love. And God is a jealous God. So what was Jesus' answer? It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. So we go back a few chapters in Deuteronomy to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'll start in verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you and to observe in the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord. Oh, look at this in here that's in the Scripture. The reason that we want to do this also is because if we already said if we obey, we'll increase, which means uh, in lineage just the same. And if we uh, worship the Lord God, obeying Him... It's so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you, so that they may also enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, just as the, Lord the God of your ancestors, promised you, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down, sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Fear the Lord your God. Serve Him only. Take your oaths in His name. As the Gentile audience here is reading Luke's words and how his gospel is laid out, Luke has presented to them, are you going to trust God? Even a simple thing as far as daily food, and are you going to trust Him when it's not there? How long will you trust Him? 
How long will it be till you take matters into your own hand because the devil's tempting you every day and you take matters into your own hand? Or you've said you've had enough. This is too much for me to follow this path. Will you remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Will you follow that narrow path, that enter through that small and narrow door that few find, but it leads to eternal life? Will you love and worship the Lord your God and Him only? You can't have other lovers. So then in verse 9, the devil led him. That's the same word as the Spirit led Jesus earlier. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he asks again, if you are, just like Jesus was asked at His crucifixion, if you are the Son of God, show us. If He was asked all throughout His ministry, if you are the Son of God, perform a miracle, show us. Wait a minute, I just did. <laughs> but you don't want to see. If you are the Son of God, come off that cross. All this temptation that Jesus faced all through His ministry, he started by being tempted, being led into a wilderness to a place he didn't want to go and had no food for 40 days and had to allow angels to attend to him, created beings. But the devil led him to Jerusalem, had him standing on the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Whether it was right or wrong again, if he did, you know, we could talk about that. But here's what the devil does now. He twists Scripture. Oh boy, how many Christians fall for that, whether they're Gentile Christians or Jewish Christians, because they want to take Scripture and fit it to their need, their desire, rather than studying and trusting in God. So the devil says, it's written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Where does that come from? Study your scripture. Oh, and a good thing is we have Bibles that tell us right underneath with little footnotes. You don't have to go looking or anything. But it's a psalm. Psalm 91. He's quoting from, from verses 11 to 12. But it's funny in this case because Jesus knows it enough. Funny not in a certain way, but funny in an ironic way of how the devil twists scripture. Because the exact opposite is usually true. You, if you eat that, you will not surely die. Well, you didn't die physically that day, but you died for all eternity. <laughs> There's a big difference, devil. And you will gain wisdom. Oh, well, yeah, wisdom that shows me that I'm a sinner before where I had wisdom where I didn't need to know anything but childlike that I'm in right standing with God and He walks with me and talks with me. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6. Fear the Lord your, your, your God, serve Him only. That was His answer to the one before, verse 13. But let's read a little further. That's why I stopped there before. And take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and, will, and His anger will burn against you. He will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test, as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees He's given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in and take over the land, the, the good land the, the Lord has promised. You may think your way is the right way. Jesus could have done that. But he said, no, I'm not going to test God. So we've gone for the bread, which I could have created again, and I want to create as a human being. I don't want to wait this time. I'm hungry. By day three, I'm hungry and want to create bread. Surely this is the right way. Lord, you don't want me. Scripture tells me all over the place that you don't want me to suffer and everything. Or are you praying for why am I still day three without bread, Lord? It's okay to ask how long, but how long are you willing? Are you willing? Do you worship God and Him only? Or will you put Him to the test? Will you take Scripture and even tw twist it and put the Lord your God to your test? Oh, let's use a good one. Faith without works is dead. I'm not going to sit here and pray about this. I'm going to go do this. 
Ah, is the Spirit leading you to do that, though? Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Just make sure you're being led and who you're being led by. So many times we think our way is right, but Scripture tells us that we plan out our steps, but God directs our paths. Verse 13, When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until a more opportune time. The temptations weren't over. The testing wasn't over. This was the start of the road. Start of the way. Maybe we ought to take new converts, and when they come up and say, I profess in Jesus Christ, throw them into a dungeon and not give them food for 40 days. I'm being silly saying that, but would you really have the faith? Boy, if, it, if I knew I did after that, I'd be thankful I got thrown in that dungeon. But at that time, I surely wouldn't want it. What are you willing to go through, do? What are you not willing to? Where will you not let the Holy Spirit lead you in your life? I told you that came from Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is about spiritual warfare for the Christian. It's got nothing to do with Jesus Himself, except it does as a man being tempted. And the end of Psalm 91 it ends this way. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, this is verse 9 of Psalm 91, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. Well, you know that doesn't mean physical again. Okay? For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. A verse that we want to use for guardian angels, and maybe it is so. But He's talking about you and I as human beings. If you say, The Lord is my refuge. If you profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, because He's God in the flesh, it was tempted in every way, so that He could be our perfect high priest. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling where you're secure. You build on that firm foundation of Jesus Christ, not build on sand. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all ways. They will lift, up, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tr tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. You'll be able to defeat the, the devil's temptations. Because He loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue Him, will protect Him, for He acknowledges my name. You know, we're not saved because we first love God, but just like this woman, this is why this, where I went with this scripture next and to build on that story, she did what she did. She went into that room and didn't worry about other people and what she thought, didn't worry about the livelihood of her perfume. She bust out in tears, and her tears were so much that they showered Jesus' feet. And then she said, what am I going to do? I, what am I going to wipe his feet with? Late, puts down her hair and wipes his feet. She did not care what anybody thought or did. She gave it all at the feet of Jesus. She worshipped him, and she left worshipping him. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue and I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy and show him my salvation. So where are you at? Have you been born by the Spirit of God? All right. Then you're a child of God. Are you being led by the Spirit is the question now. That's the question the woman faced. It's the question you face. And will you go where you don't want to go? Will you serve and minister to others because God, the Son of God, served, ministered, and gave His life for you? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for what Jesus did for us. That He humbled Himself and gave up heaven that He humbled Himself and was born of, of human parents, that He lived a life where He says He didn't even have a place to lay His head. Father, that He didn't, wasn't enticed by the things of this world, but, but fixed His eyes on suffering to bring us eternal life. That He allowed the Spirit to lead Him through the temptations in the wilderness, and that He did not sin, so that He was the perfect, blameless sacrifice for us. 
And as he willingly gave up his life, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he said it was finished. Because the sacrifice was made for all mankind if they would just believe. So, Father, help us not only to believe, but to help our unbelief. Help us to not just realize that we're children of God, but to be led by the Spirit in each and every way that, that the Spirit leads us. And help us be united together as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, serving one another and serving others until we meet Jesus face to face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.